Hello everyone, this is Rabab Alma, licensed marriage and family therapist and an international life coach. I am happy to interview today uh, Jessica Pavelka and she will join me shortly. I will invite her. Um, okay. So again, these um, lives and um, these uh, interviews are not meant for medical or for um, uh, therapeutic help. It is uh, for general info only. I am waiting for Jessica to uh, join me. I'm so excited actually to have Jessica on the line. She is from Fred she is uh, she works in Philadelphia and uh, she is a licensed psychotherapist and a meditation and yoga healer. Um, I have these lives and um, interviews weekly. The interviews is usually like monthly, uh, and the lives is week are weekly. Um, it's important for me to connect uh, with people and to um, receive their inquiries, their questions, and keep the interaction. Um, Jessica is uh, uh, setting her password, so I'm waiting for her. It's gonna take a couple of minutes. Uh, Again, I am interviewing. Uh, I will be interviewing Jessica Pavelka. She is a licensed psychotherapist, and she is okay. She is online, so let me invite her shortly. So again, these interviews and lives are just general for general info only. They are not meant for medical advice or for therapeutic. Hi. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much for taking the time. Yes. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Yes, it's so lovely to connect. I love connecting with you, it's a joy. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Let me introduce you. So Jessica Babelka, she is a licensed psychotherapist, meditation and yoga healer. So thank you for joining us again. Uh, to the audience, if you have any question, please put it in the comment section and I will address it and uh, to, the, to the guest so she can uh, ask your question, uh, answer your questions. So the first question, tell us about your profession and um, uh, what do you do, what population do you, do you serve, uh, your interests and hobbies? Yeah, of course. So I have my private practice in Center City. So I'm located in Rittenhouse. Um, and I'm there seeing adults. I do primarily individual therapy and family counseling. Uh, my approach to therapy is cognitive based. So I see a lot of adults with anxiety disorders um, and mood disorders such as depression and bipolar. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy really works well in supporting that population to find healing through talk therapy. Um, and then at times I'm, you know, bringing in some psychodynamic work to, of course, explore kind of the individual's past. And I'm really excited to now be threading in mindfulness techniques and meditation. Um, so at times, we will practice mindfulness in the moment when we are in session. Um, and that can be, you know, just taking a moment to really observe what's happening within the body. Um, it could be breathing exercises. So there's a lot out there. So it's wonderful for people with anxiety to be able to walk out of the office with all these coping skills, you know, within their toolbox that they can use outside of session. Um, and then guided meditation, and uh, I'm excited now because I'm doing mental health yoga workshops. So I've done a few for the past few years, yoga for anxiety and yoga for depression. Um, there's one coming up in February at Wake Up Yoga in Center City, and that will be yoga for the winter blues. So we'll really be um, kind of working with like the stagnation that we feel in the winter and, you know, having less sunlight definitely impacts our mood. So we'll be finding an invigorating um, meditation and breathing exercise practice that will be wonderful in combating some of these depressive symptoms that tend to show up. So, yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. 
and it's, and it's needed, you know, in, in this time, you know, the time of the holidays. It can be exciting, but it can be also like a depressing for some. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's very important for people to have both um, um, options, if you will. So our topic for today is healing through natural uh, meditation. Yeah. So what does meditation and yoga mean to you? Yeah. And why did you choose that in particular? Yeah. Well, so I've been studying holistic health since 2009. I've worked with um, a division manager at the University of Penn, where we were drafting um, and compiling all of this research that was showing that yoga asana really supports people in managing uncomfortable symptoms. Meditation, Reiki, walking meditation, there's just all of these tools that are known as the kind of under the umbrella of complementary and alternative medicine. So with all the research out there, um, I pursued my meditation and yoga trainings, and I've also done a ton of trauma-informed mindfulness, which is really important work. Um, and so really bringing in the, all of that together, I found it hard not to bring that into the talk therapy session. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny, a lot of clients that do come to me end up having some yoga meditation practice, or they're really interested in perhaps slowly tapering off medication and using their own tools internally to manage symptoms. So um, meditation is helpful in learning more about yourself in this kind and nurturing way, um, really facilitating this lens of compassion. Like I can, the client can feel better through talk therapy and counseling, but do they really completely know the in and outs of their being? And when we join the mind, the brain, and the body, we really feel this empowerment. Um, a lot of my clients leave sessions feeling empowered. And like they're like, wow, now I know what's going on. So um, it's been really great work. And um, it's it's tangible to people, you know, they don't have to have a previous meditation practice to uh, kind of do this natural meditation is what I've been what I've been coaching. That's amazing. I, I see a lot of people are moving away from medications and trying to find some holistic, homeopathic approaches for whatever symptoms they are experiencing. Because you know, as we know, every medication has a side effect and sometimes we're just numbing the symptoms we're not really dealing with the issue from you know at its, at its depth so that's that's amazing yeah 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 so so how does healing through meditation is different than healing through yoga what is the difference between the two? yeah well healing through yoga is really learning about your body right so it's about learning and tuning into the aches and sensations in the body um what we know is there's nadis through the body. So throughout our body, there's these energy channels. And with trauma and with depression and anxiety, we tend to feel kind of stuck. So these rivers and these energy flows through the body have almost like a dam there and they're feeling stuck. And when you get on the mat and you start to expand your body with the use of pranayama, which is some breathing exercises with movement, it's a, you start to foster this space for yourself where you can really listen into what's going on and you can find stability and strength, strengthening the body, strengthening through the breath is really a profound practice. A lot of what people experience in their personal life tends to come up on the mat. So there's some poses like if you focus on hip openers, we actually store a lot of emotion within our hips. So if we're in a pose such as pigeon, I'll notice some of my students actually start to tear up because there's this emotional release happening at the cellular and chemical level. Um, and so that's like a doorway for them to learn more about, wow, I didn't know that was there, right? Wow. And so yoga... <laughs> can be really profound. Um, just getting into your body is important. 
And healing through meditation is this way of now I know more about who I am and now I know more about what's bothering me. Do I have the ability to sit mindfully and allow myself to feel those things? So meditation is like this slowing down and sitting with in a way where you're again fostering the sense of self-compassion and being able to sit through stress and feel and build on resilience it's pretty remarkable it really Absolutely. it's like now you're describing it i feel like i feel different i <laughs> like i want to meditate <laughs> <laughs> yeah we can do that at the end if you're open to yeah, it we sure. can, yeah. of course we can have the viewers that join us and we can Absolutely. That will be like very exciting. You know, we can have like live session. Amazing. So when we have this, when you, we do a meditation and this self-awareness that we are experiencing, how does that uh, mediate healing? How does that foster healing from your perspective? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking. You know, I think with the how fast pace our world is today you know we're so plugged in on our phone and technology and our minds always racing we always have these thoughts of my to-do list and what's going to happen in the future or i can't believe that happened in the past and we tend to really stay away from the only moment that's happening which is the present moment and so really practicing these mindfulness techniques and having a meditation practice gives you the opportunity to slow down. And it's really difficult. Like I know people, I have, you know, certain friends and clients and things. There's a, per there's a personality where we're really just high driven. We have to go, go, go. And slowing down is almost painful for some people. But what happens when we do that? all of a sudden we start to, huh, we get a little bit curious. We're like, I wonder why I feel that or where that's coming from. And so it's like this whole other doorway and entryway to like this self-discovery. It's important to know who we are, what we want, how we're feeling, and allow that to inform how we spend our days rather than getting up, plugging in, on this autopilot, it really takes us away from, you know, our natural, natural state and honest, true way of how we really want to be. So according to what you're saying, I think that will maybe influence eventually the way we prioritize, mm. the way we uh, maybe manage our time, the way um, maybe we choose to respond or when to respond and how to respond. Yeah. And to think how empowering that is, right? Exactly. Absolutely. To have that choice. And sometimes that choice is five seconds or two breaths before we're responding to that text message or that email. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I um, Hal Henkel, uh, the one who does the uh, screen-free parenting, he has this short uh, tips, like weekly, and he talks about pausing. Like th that pause, and maybe that can change, like the way you will react to write that text, send it or not sending oh. it. It's 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 amazing. Yeah, it's like it feels like we are um, taking our power mm -hmm. back, if you will. And who doesn't need more of that, right? Absolutely. I think all of us. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, I am interviewing uh, Jessica Pavelka. She is a licensed psychotherapist and meditation and yoga healer in, from Philadelphia. And if you have any questions, please put it in the comment section. And I am enjoying the conversation with Jessica. Please join us. So how do you think it's important for people to practice meditation and yoga um, and to incorporate that within their daily lives? Yeah, 
like out of your their off your office they go to you and they experience it and they are feeling better and empowered mm -hmm. and maybe they see you once or twice a week how about the rest of the week how important that is yeah that's a good question um you know i think for someone who might be new to meditation um you know it's it's important not to go back to that autopilot working really hard and thinking that all of a sudden day one, let me set a 30 minute timer and dive in. You know, I probably wouldn't recommend that. But what I would say is for a meditation practice, find an author, you know, that interests you that maybe writes about meditation i would recommend mm -hmm. a meditation teacher his name is lauren roche his last name is spelled r-o-c-h-e and he's based out of california i actually have this book that i recommend and it's called meditation made easy and it's by lauren roche and he's been studying meditation for over 50 years um, and he's really studied his clients that come to him from the beginning of their practice till years after, and it's remarkable. And what I would so what I would suggest is setting maybe a timer on your watch for, you know, one minute in the morning and one minute when you get home after work, and just kind of sit and maybe just be with your breath, you know, and really just start there, and you'd be pretty amazed and surprised about how much a minute just a minute can do for you and then I would say over time maybe make it to two minutes and so you start incremental um, you know consistency is more important than quantity so you don't want to do 30 minutes once a month it would be a little easier and more effective to practice a minute or two a day consistently um, and then I would say in terms of yoga, a good recommendation is to start with restorative yoga. So um, restorative yoga, you really might only do four or five postures throughout the entire practice. And throughout the practice, you're really comforted by all of these bolsters and blankets and blocks and eye masks and sandbags and you know, you can really go all out and the teacher, of course, will guide the students on how to do so. But with restorative yoga, you're in a pose for, you know, over five minutes. And what's happening to your nervous system in those moments is you're engaging the parasympathetic nervous system. So this rest and digest system, you're informing the body that it's okay to relax and that you're safe. And so healing happens in those moments at the cellular level. And with a consistent restorative yoga practice, you will feel that empowerment that we've talked about. You know, the practice isn't fast paced, go, go, go. But with a restorative practice, you might leave feeling more energized, like you can complete the rest of your tasks that are on your to do list. So I would say those are my two recommendations for beginners. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And thank you for bringing the book. Yeah, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. And yeah. uh, yeah. I have a book behind me, Meditation Secrets for Women. And Lauren Roche's partner uh, wrote that book. And she's remarkable and has really done a lot of uh, movement therapy for people uh, with a trauma history. So highly recommend that. Wow, thank you, thank you, and I hope uh, my our audience take a note of it. Maybe after the live, if you can, maybe um, put the com the name of the book and the author in the comment section, uh, so people can remember it. I really appreciate it. Thank That's you. Great. So, yeah, thank you. So, with within yoga and meditation, and so how does really healing, you know, take place? What happens? Uh, of course, you, you touched on that and you said that how we get grounded. And, but what is it that's happening to the, to the mind and body? Uh, and what is the first, I'm sorry, what is the first sign of healing? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, how do, you, oh, how do you recognize yeah. this? How do you see that it's happening? That's a really good question. Um, 
So with meditation, right? So if we are working to check in with the body and we have this practice of relaxing the muscles in the body and engaging that parasympathetic nervous system over time because of the neuroplasticity that happens in the brain, right? The brain's ability to change shape and to rewire itself. When someone's in a state of rest, that is really profound and they're no longer maybe engaging with um, some of the anger or impulsivity, right? Because they're not in that state. So it's physically impossible to be reactive. And so over time, that's powerful. So I can give an example of someone that I was seeing for meditation coaching. And this, this person here um, felt a little fear around sadness. And so that's common, right? We tend to want to push away any feelings of discomfort. And so what we were able to do was do a meditation practice that welcomed some of the sadness. And so with this client's ability to be in parasympathetic dominance in that resting state, breathing and allowing the mind to wonder and have thoughts that come up for them in this welcoming, accepting way, this client found that sadness wasn't dangerous. And person realized that they could feel fully safe in this capsule in this body and emotions came and it was like this soft tender way of this person nurturing themselves in the moment over time you know after that session and after that meditation practice the client really reflected and was like wow i'm really allowing myself to feel this, this sensation of accepting. And so meditation gives you the, the ability to really sit with difficult emotions and difficult experiences. And it's important to, you know, practice this kind of style of meditation with a, a coach um, that is experienced in this just because you don't want to, you know, harm yourself in any way. So when you practice, I mean, there's a chemical reaction happening, right? So at the chemical level of the brain, you are healing and it's profound. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. So when we know all of this about meditation and yoga, why people resist meditation? Why do we resist? Yeah. And there are so many studies and books about it and we resist. We just why and how what do we do and why what's the reason behind mm -hmm. that yeah i will say in my experience the reason that i see the most is it's a defense mechanism of not wanting to feel and i think that there's intelligence to that so i tell a lot of my clients that your mind and body is always trying to protect you and there's something really sacred and beautiful about that. So if someone's not ready for meditation or yoga, I think that it's important to honor that. And I actually reinforce that. You know, I think that it's important to really listen. And then over time, someone might start to get a little curious. And usually those are in the moments where they're feeling more empowered because they have a set of coping skills from talk therapy. Where like, mm -hmm. I think I'm ready to maybe dip my toe in a little bit. And then it's like that other whole doorway and they start to expand and grow in a whole new way. So I think, um, you know, not all people are ready to sit and be with the breath and be with themselves because mm -hmm. it is scary, you know? Yeah, yes, it is. It is scary. It's kind of like you're going to be like just in touch with yourself and this can be scary to people yeah. a, lot of I unknowns, a lot of unknowns yeah a lot of unknowns absolutely uncertainty thank you for everyone watching marissa lawton muhammad rushdie reem adil lena 
Lana, thank you so much for, for watching. If you have any question, please put it in the comment section uh, for our guest, uh, Jessica. So, so do you, do you recommend that people do talk therapy, therapy before uh, meditation or there is no correlation? We can start either. Mm -hmm. It depends on the student or practitioner, you know, if there's someone out there that's really connecting with a certain meditation center, there's usually, um, you know, people there that can lead you through a practice, um, you know, so I would say if someone's really solely interested in meditation, to find maybe a few centers that are in their area and maybe experiment with a few different styles. I think at this point, there's over 80,000 styles of meditation right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, are you an expert to tell you which one? <laughs> right, so kind of nice to have a few that work for you. Um, yes. And yeah, if someone's interested in kind of the one-on-one -on -one support, finding a meditation coach, um, can be, can be, um, a good step, but yeah. Um, do you do that? Can you do that online? Do you like coach people for, to meditate online? Yeah, I'm happy to do that for sure. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. That can be, you know, handy for people, you know, who don't want to drive for instance, long distance. Oh yeah. That's amazing. So how do you encourage people to meditate regularly? So you have encouraged me <laughs> already. <laughs> to, That's... Uh, and to practice with you live, imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah how, yeah, how do you encourage people to do it regularly, to like be consistent? Yeah. You know, to be honest, I really like to meet people where they're at. So... Mm -hmm. I might not even bring up meditation to somebody until maybe they're ready. You know, if I'm working with someone that's experiencing a lot of anxiety and we're exploring um, through psychotherapy what's going on and we do some mindfulness practices or some breathing, they might ask about meditation and then I'm happy to kind of bring them on that path. I think mm -hmm. kind of something special about someone you know, showing up when they're ready. I think that that's really nice to really honor what someone's interested in. I don't really want to ever force any of my ideas or practices, or I think you should do this kind of thing. I like to empower the individual. Um, but of course, I am always providing a little bit of insight here and there. And if there's, if something sparks curiosity, we can always dive into that. Amazing. So, so how do you integrate for people, for instance, they don't know about um, uh, yoga or meditation. So how do you integrate that with talk therapy within the session? Yeah. Yeah. So primarily, I when I'm doing the talk therapy, we're doing pranayama breathing exercises, guided meditation and mindfulness practices in the session. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I do have a yoga mat in the office and at times I, someone, if they're interested, they're welcome to um, practice on the mat, some of the breathing and meditation. A lot of the yoga I've kept in yoga studio settings for this time. So you'll find a lot of my workshops online where I'll be doing the mental health yoga. And then in those workshops, I'm really talking about um, the psychoeducation piece, like what is anxiety, what's happening in my body, um, and then we're putting some of these tools into practice, and we have a yoga practice about an hour long, where we're doing postures that are alleviating some of these symptoms, and we're not doing anything to kind of rev up the nervous system in any way, everything is counteracting to alleviate, um, and so I've had someone say to me after leaving the yoga for anxiety workshop that felt like a mini therapy session and really relaxing yoga. That was great. And they mentioned feeling symptom relief for like three weeks after that with just one. Oh. So that's wonderful. That's amazing. Actually, that's amazing. So, so you do uh, psychotherapy and you do yoga. 
do you offer both to the same client? Is that the yoga and meditation you consider it also a therapy or coaching, or this is a different service? How how does that work from mm -hmm. from um, you know from a client perspective? Like, do you offer it to the same or not? Yeah. So for my clients for individual therapy, I can mm -hmm. see them also for meditation coaching, and then I kind of adjust and um, kind of support them by using the meditation practice to individualize for what they're experiencing. So for talk therapy clients, they do come to me for meditation coaching. The yoga workshops, actually just because of dual relationship and current yes. or former clients, um, I give them recommendations for other yoga classes outside of the workshops just because therapy clients can't necessarily see me in another setting, um, just to protect their privacy. And um, yes, yeah, that's yeah. Thank you for point, uh, to touching on that because that's what I actually pointing at the, the dual relationship and how does that work? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so what tips can you give people to be for them to be open for uh, meditation and yoga? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say. Again, if you can pick up this book by Lauren Roche, Meditation Made Easy, uh, he's a wonderful teacher where he explores with you probably, um, well, he explores with you by identifying how you're probably already practicing meditation without even knowing it. So I'll ask you a question. Is there anything that you do, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but is there anything that you do in your day-to-day -day life that you feel kind of in flow where you're just pretty focused on what you're doing and you're kind of just within yourself? Sometimes it could be driving, you know, folding laundry, I've heard yeah. someone say. Anything that... Driving, driving, driving. Yeah. So what do you, how do you feel when you're driving? What's that experience like? So I usually drive in silence. I don't like to listen to anything while I'm driving. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, the window will be a little bit open so I can have some breeze. If it's not so cold mm -hmm. or so, so hot. And if I am not following, like it's not a new direction or a new location. So I know where I'm going. It's just like thoughts are, are flowing, you know. And sometimes I say some prayers or whatever, something. Just It's like a meditation time, especially if it's a long drive, like a 45 minutes or something like that. I just want that time. And sometimes I delay my prayers, my daily prayers to the drive because I know I'm going to be so quiet. Uh, I'm not going to be on the phone. Nothing is really uh, uh, interrupting me. So I can really relate. Yeah. 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 How does that yeah. drive? How does that make you feel? Like, what do you experience doing that in the moment or after the drive? I think I feel so, I feel the calmness, the quietness, the connection. Sometimes you will have, to, I have some um, reflections that I, I contemplate certain things. It's like it's very calming for me, very, like I, I, I don't, when I am like at the traffic light and I hear another car has music, I, I, I can't wait until I just continue driving because it's like disturbing my, um, my quietness, if you will. Yeah. And it's especially because, you know, when I see, you know, when you see clients and sometimes you just want that quietness, you don't want anything to really interfere with that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it feels, you feel that flow and you feel it like in your body, like you feel it all over. And the taste yeah. for it now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes like, even if there, if I'm thinking about something like some, like a, an issue that's bothering me or something that I need to take a decision or, or so sometimes I feel inspired, like while I'm driving, you know, doing that, this happens to me while driving and also early in the morning when I wake up for my morning prayer. It's like ideas will flow. It's like it's like this quietness, this silence, mm. this connection. Mm. It's uh, and I think when we do it like often every day, then it becomes like part of our daily routine. And when you don't do it, it's like God forbid, like I I overslept, that it's like oh, I missed a really important time of my day. So I wait for the next day. To yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. That's so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. See, you asked. I like your question. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. So let's notice what was said, right? One thing you mm -hmm. feel in flow. Mm -hmm. So there's this quality of allowing the thoughts to come. And you're not mm -hmm. really attaching to a certain thought. You said you're letting them flow. And mm -hmm. thoughts are just coming. And then maybe you feel the breeze coming in with the window down. And then you might move into prayer practice. Right? So in those moments, your nervous system is relaxed. Yes. There's no resisting happening, happening to your thoughts and your mind. Mm -hmm. And so there's healing. <clears throat> so the, the mind, the brain, right? Its job is to think. Its job is to yeah. just like spew out thoughts all the time. And so kind of in the moment, something that Lauren, Dr. Lauren Roche says is that when you're driving, your mind is essentially clearing its desk and then after the drive, you're feeling more organized, more in the moment. And you, mm -hmm. when I don't have this drive, I can feel like something was missing. So your meditation routine is actually already in place. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we just don't know the, la the, the label. Sometimes we just, we just want to have that name it like as meditation. Yeah. I, I think quietness and just be connecting with ourselves is extremely important just to have this sense of grounding again. Wow. Like you said, it's, 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 yeah, that's amazing. I, I like that, uh, that touch that you spend on, 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 on that drive and the morning prayers. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so I would uh, say I, to the viewers, they might take yeah. a moment on their own, maybe bring out their journal or something. And maybe the viewers can take a moment just to think about what do I do in my day that I feel really kind of nurtured, that I feel like I'm filling up my internal like gas tank, like I'm giving myself this energy that I need. I'm filling my cup up. It could be a drive. It could be cooking. It could be gardening. Some people like to be outdoors for their meditation. Some people like to do it when they're really comfortable laying down with a cozy blanket. So I would encourage some of the viewers to think of a time where they feel like they're just truly with themselves. And I would consider how those times make them feel. You know, meditation um, and my understanding of instinctual style of meditation <laughs> is you know, allowing yourself to be who you are, welcoming thoughts in your meditation practice if they're interesting to you. If a thought comes up in your meditation practice that you don't want to think about, you don't have to. You can come back to your breath. You can come back to a feeling that maybe you want to feel more often. So there's a lot of different styles and practices that are underneath the umbrella of instinctual style of meditation. So there's many doorways that people can enter to come into this natural style of meditation that is very different from mindfulness. So I would like to just make this um, distinction. Yes, um, People are practicing mindfulness meditation. And mindfulness meditation says being present in the moment without any judgment. And so when you're practicing mindfulness meditation, like a guided meditation, the meditation teacher will often say, if the mind wanders, come back to the breath. It's the subtle encouragement of trying to stop your thinking or to clear your mind. And Lauren Roche's practice is really bringing this householder theme, saying that we're not monks, we're not living in a monastery. It's kind of impossible to clear our mind, right? We have a, mm -hmm. a to-do list. We have to get you know, gas after class, and we have to write this paper, and we have to take this call. The mind is going to think. 
And what happens with for some people if they're not practicing the right style that doesn't fit their constitution, they tend to have this like internal criticism where they're judging their self, themselves thinking that they're not meditating and it's discouraging. So people might just stop the practice altogether because they're kind of like, well, I can't stop my thoughts. I can't clear my mind. I must not know how to do it. So I'm going to give up. Oh. Instinctual <clears throat> style of meditation is this idea that the mind isn't wandering, it's wondering. Similarly to you driving, your mind is going through different events and it's sorting itself out. It's like organizing and putting the files away. Resetting. Reset. <laughs> so your meditation practice might feel like you're having a lot of thoughts and that's totally okay. And then the, the individual might feel some rest and some relaxation after their meditation practice. So the difference there, mindfulness meditation has the breath as an anchor to keep coming back, keep coming back. Natural instinctual style of meditation says if the mind goes and that thought's interesting to you, you can go there. So it's oh, allowing, free. Yeah, that's liberating, actually. That's liberating. Yeah. I like that. Because, yes, I'm thinking now when you were saying um, the first one, yeah, I think someone might feel guilty. Like, I, I, I really can't really get my thoughts out. I, I really can't focus. And like you said, they might think that they didn't meditate. Yeah. They didn't do a good job. And then we are adding to the list of guilt. That, <laughs> this one. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So we're already dealing with a lot of anxiety and, you know, so, so adding that to it, then people will just cross it off because I don't need, I don't need that guilt, not one more. Yeah. So I like that, uh, the other approach that it's just be, yeah. allowing yourself to be amazing. Yeah. 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 So um, I want to thank again, people who are, uh, who joined us, Dahlia, Estella, uh, uh, Asia, um, anyone who has a question, people are, uh, you know, sending your, lo their love and to you and likes. Uh, so thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Very actually relaxing, if you will. Just listening to you, explaining that. It's very relaxing and very, like, put things in perspective. And correcting a lot of our sometimes maybe um, people who don't uh, practice medication, uh, meditation, um, the misconception about it's restricting, it's um, time consuming, it doesn't work, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for correcting that and, and, and taking the time. So when would you like, so I have a couple of last questions about you know, your future plan, professional plans, and how people can reach you. And would you like to do our meditation before or after? Yeah, let's, uh, let's dive into some meditation. Okay, so I'm all yours. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I would suggest just finding a comfortable seat. So starting with planting the feet evenly on the ground, you know, drawing the shoulders up to the ears and allowing the shoulder blades to come down the back. And then just allowing the palms to rest on the thighs or the knees. Option to soften the eyelids over the eyes. Finding a place in front of you to rest your gaze. And if it's comfortable for you, you can close the eyes. And without doing much of anything, just see if you can place some attention on your breath. Start to notice perhaps the sound of your inhale. And on your exhale, maybe just let the shoulders fall away from the ears, allowing yourself to sink into the chair a little bit more. Continuing with this breath, 
You might soften any tension that you're holding in the forehead, in the eyes, or the jaw. Just giving the body permission to relax the muscles in the body 10% more. And just see if you can be in this way with the breath. And if the mind goes off in thought, and that thought is interesting to you, you may allow the mind to wander and to drift, knowing that you don't have to act on any of your thoughts. And that your mind is just organizing and clearing its desk. Always having that option to return back to a deep inhale. You might open your mouth and sigh it out. And we'll continue five more breaths here. Breathing in, filling up at the low belly, expanding at the ribs, and breathing into the chest. And as you exhale, the chest falls, the ribs come in, and the belly deflates. Just breathing in, noticing the parts of the body that move with every in-breath. Notice how the body relaxes at the out-breath. Letting yourself be just as you are. You might say in your mind, I welcome all of myself here. Start to move towards an exhale. And all together, we'll take a deep breath in through the nose. At the top of that breath, inhale a little bit more. And exhale to release. One last time, inhale. And exhale to let go. Feeling the place where your back makes contact with your chair. Feeling your hips in the chair and your feet on the ground. Bring some attention to your hands resting on your thighs. You might feel some subtle sensations in the body, some tingling. Just notice. With a three to five minutes of a meditation practice of breathing with a relaxed body, you reach a state that's more restorative and deeper than sleep. We'll slowly start to bring our gaze out in front of us, gently fluttering the eyes open. Just spend a moment here, maybe thanking yourself for taking a few moments. Just feeling the healing quality of your breath and of your presence. And then we'll slowly return back. That was amazing. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I think this will encourage everyone, all the viewers, including myself, to meditate more, to have this peace sensation, if you want, mm -hmm. all over. So, 
again, if you have, for the viewers, if you have any comments or question, please post it in the comment section. I don't see questions so far, but I see a lot of uh, hearts and... <laughs> so, so I want to, uh, again, thank you for this uh, meditation. Uh, it was very nice at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, very helpful. Uh, so what are your future professional plans? Yeah. Well, I'm going to continue with uh, psychotherapy. So continuing individual cognitive behavioral therapy and family counseling. Working one-on-one -on -one with adults is such a passion of mine. Um, I never doubted my career path. Ever since I was a little girl, I knew I wanted to be a therapist, and here I am. So on that front, nothing will be changing. Um, but I'm going to continue deepening my meditation practice. Um, I'll be out in California in February studying under uh, my meditation teacher, Lauren Roche. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm in a two to five program with him. So I will be getting my certification for natural meditation, instinctual style of meditation, um, which I'm really looking forward to. I'll be continuing doing the mental health yoga workshops. Uh, I still teach yoga around the city and I continue with the meditation coaching. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. I am working on a project now with a meditation teacher in the city, and we're really focusing heavily on trauma-informed mindfulness and meditation. So um, there's a lot of wonderful meditation teachers out there and yoga teachers out there, but it's important that counselors and therapists join with these teachers that way, this mind-body practice is trauma-informed. Um, a lot of people with a trauma background might experience some disassociation and other symptoms similar too. And we really want to make sure that this work that we're doing, because there's such good intention behind it of healing, we want to make sure that the healing is happening. Um, and so I'm working on trauma-informed mindfulness-based stress reduction. And so that will be coming out uh, in eight-week series where, you know, anybody can come and attend that. And I'll be writing some research. Uh, and so that will be the project that you will see in the near future. That's very exciting. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. That's, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah. So, um uh, Reem said, thank you so much for the meditation. Oh. Seems like some people were following and were meditating with oh, us. Oh, good. It's amazing, yes. Wonder. So how can people reach you? Yeah, I will be happy to leave my website down below once we're um, done with tonight. But they can contact me by sending me an email. Um, that's usually the best way. And um, happy to talk by phone. Um, the Yoga for Winter Blues is happening in February. It's February 4th, I want to say. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's at Wake Up Yoga in Center City, and that's an open invitation. Um, so that's a good opportunity to put some of what we talked about today into practice. Practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, what are your final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with, uh, with everyone? With the audience I would just like to say you know I really do believe that the mind and body is always working to heal itself even when it might not feel that way and mm -hmm. so I really would encourage anyone to allow themselves to have more time for rest um, and that could be sitting on their meditation cushion. That could be laying down for a meditation or walking or driving or cooking. I would really encourage people to just spend a few moments, even just a minute or so, 
just to notice how they feel today. Um, and I think that really has a wonderful, beautiful healing trickle down effect. I want to thank you so much for your time and for this really amazing, delightful conversation, mm -hmm. for the meditation, meditation session that you provided for all of us. I really enjoyed it. And I can see people also enjoyed it online. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again. And I hope that we can collaborate again in the future. This was an amazing experience with you, Jessica. I really appreciate your time. It really is such an honor connecting with you. Um, I'm so happy that we've connected and it's been really wonderful. Um, you know, you do wonderful work and um, you really do serve the clients and the families that you work with. And I look Thank forward you. to continue communicating and talking. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a wonderful you evening. Too. Thanks. And thank you for the audience. Good. Please like and share this video. I will download it on YouTube so you can watch it on my page or Jessica's or YouTube. Thank you again and thank you, Jessica. You. Until good night. Have a good night. Good night.